Merry Christmas, everyone. It's uh, Dave Barnett. I'm here with the number one, the first holiday chat episode for the 2022 season. And if you're a subscriber to the email list, then that means you're probably watching this at Christmas in 2022. And if you're not a subscriber to the email list, it means you're probably watching this sometime or listening sometime in the summer of, of 23. And so I'll remind everyone, if you want to get these calls first, sign up for the email list, head over to davidcbarnettlist.com. And uh, it's absolutely free to subscribe. And uh, our guest today, Chuck, was uh, somebody who pays attention and probably is on the email list. Are you on the email list, Chuck? Yeah. Yeah, of course. So he got one of these spots. And so if you want to come on and appear as a holiday uh, chat guest, then being on the email list at sometime mm -hmm. in the fall is how you is how you get your spot. So Chuck, I'm going to, I'm going to turn the agenda over to you. What, uh, what would you like to discuss today? Well, uh, thank you so much for, for getting me in the, the, I guess your program here to help business owners. Um, I have a couple things that, that I'd like to cover. First of all, I have, uh, uh I own an IT service company mm -hmm. uh, in, in Florida. And uh, I've had it about eight years. And uh, I also uh, am interested in getting your recommendation on, on uh, whether or not it would make sense for me to get by an online business. I'm thinking like a content type of business. So you want to talk about your IT business that you've had for eight years and you want to see if it makes yeah. sense to get into an online content business. Right. Okay. Why don't you tell me about the IT service business that you're doing right now? What kind of things are you doing for customers? Uh, well, we are primarily a business to business uh, co company, and we uh, specialize in, in really trying to understand uh, our customers' businesses and, and you know, really focus on not just fixing the, the technical tickets that get submitted, which obviously we do that, but and, and any IT company does that. You know, we all have technicians, smart guys, and, you know, people can tell if we can fix a server better than somebody else can fix a server. And uh, so we really tried to differentiate ourselves by taking the time to really understand uh, their business overall and what areas of their business actually have the greatest impact. You know, the purpose of technology is to uh, in, increase uh, productivity and efficiency. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes that gets lost by traditional IT companies. They just come in, you know, say the client submits a ticket and they, they come in to fix the ticket that was reported and uh, they don't stop and look about uh, how is this user actually uh, using the technology uh, to get their job done that they're doing, and uh, is is what the way they're using it actually the best way that it could be used in the most most efficient way? Obviously, technology you know evolves rapidly, and a lot of times what we find is businesses uh, are still doing things uh, you know the way they always did it, and so. Typically what happens, you know, IT technicians are not, uh, you know, very interested in business. They're more interested in, you know, in technology, industry, and uh, they they tend to just fix the, fix the problem back to normal, you know, back to the way it was. Yep. And they don't stop to sort of quiz the customer on what is the actual objective here that you're trying to uh, you know company mission and and your personal goal uh, that you're trying to achieve and uh, so what we do is we step back for a second I mean you have to fix the problem and get the get the person back to work so they're not losing time uh, but we train our people to actually take a step back and, and look at what what it is the job they're trying to get done and is there a way, some way, even a small way that technology could help them do that job better? And, uh, you know, uh, frequently there is. And uh, 
you know, so that really takes the relationship to another level because it means that we can actually improve our performance to the point where it can even sometimes offset the cost of our service. So can you, you give know, me an example of how you help someone that way? Yeah. So we have one customer that's a small manufacturer and they had uh, some manual processes of um, actually handwriting blueprints. And uh, so one of our guys said, uh, you know, there's actually uh, some technology, even though it's not, you wouldn't call it state-of-the-art technology. <laughs> it's just a, a machine called a plotter that can actually print these blueprints for them instead of drawing them by hand. You know, they had always done it this way. And uh, so you can imagine how labor intensive it is to hand draw blueprints. And so, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, not cheap technology. I think they spent five or six grand to do that. And uh, but when they got it going, you know, it was it enabled them to do that job with about, you know, half the people. Now, it was like only two or three people doing the job, but, you know, they only needed one to one and a half after that. Yeah. And so it was a huge payback, you know, to the, to the investment. And previous uh, two or three IT companies that have been before us, and I'm talking about over a period of years, had never even mentioned that or attempted uh, to solve that problem or identify the problem. So how do you, how do you charge your customers? Like, how do you, how do you figure out what sort of bill to send them? We, we charge uh, by the number of users that they have. So uh, it's a unlimited uh, support program where we put uh, basic security in place and uh, manage their network, you know, uh, remotely as much as possible and then go on site for whatever, any problems that we can't solve remotely. And we have a network operations center called a NOC in, in the IT world. And uh, they have several hundred technicians uh, in that uh, in that NOC. And we don't own it, we contract with them. And so we're a small mom and pop IT company, only five employees now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, we have our, our ground force that is the onsite uh, uh, guys that handle whatever can't be done remotely. And then, but we have this, uh, this knock that can handle, you know, unlimited amount of work. So it, it makes it very scalable uh, for us as a, as a tech company to be able to, to grow our business. Uh, so, and operationally, we're actually quite efficient and, and real, real good response time. We have operations people that are very experienced and, you know, uh, I'm not really needed much in the operational day-to-day -day of the business. Where I am needed is, is uh, the sales aspect of it. And uh, that's where we have really struggled as a company. And uh, we used to, when I bought the company eight years ago, it was a B2B IT service as well as a retail computer repair for residential people. It was a combination, okay. which is unusual. You know, most, uh, most IT companies are usually one or the other. And uh, so anyway, it had been a going concern for several years. And that was my goal. I'm not an IT technician myself. So uh, I just wanted to buy something that's been around for a long time, had a good name. And as long as I didn't come in there and do something dumb, drastic, screwed up, it would just keep on keeping on until I could, you know, figure out the best way to, to start growing it. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't realize that they, the infrastructure that they had was, um, impossible <laughs> to grow very manual and uh, very uh, inadequate to uh, actually even service business customers efficiently. The repair shop did fine, did well. And uh, I spent a lot of time and money growing our uh, Google reviews uh, because, you know, IT people aren't famous for their customer service. So, that was how, in the early days, I just wanted to differentiate our business as a whole, was to become a very highly uh, IT company and get a repair shop, and then uh, you know have that 
help us to grow going forward. And uh, it, it okay, has and well so the- and so is the is the retail store still open, or did you close that at some point? Uh, well, we we still have the business, but during the pandemic, uh, we had a combination of pandemic and road construction in front of our store and uh even one of my ex-employees uh opened up a store down the road from us so uh against our agreement so we've got a little legal situation going on currently but anyway business dwindled for those reasons and uh in and for those reasons and in combination with our goal being to move to a b2b only platform because it's you know it's a way way better revenue uh, from the time spent and uh, but of course very competitive so we we uh, moved our office uh, to a, a downtown location and uh, we shut down the repair shop because it, it, it dwindled to where you know getting even difficult to make the rent. And uh, we just do on-site work now for our residential companies with the intent of, you know, getting away from that business entirely at some point in the near future. Okay. And uh, so the number of your business-to-business customers, has it been growing or shrinking? Uh, neither. It's just been stagnant. Static. And okay. so uh, with the loss of the revenue from the repair shop and... Uh, so that has put us in the hole every month. And uh, during the pandemic, we, we, I was having some health problems and unable to really manage the business, uh, you know, very well. Uh, so I brought in a guy to help me run it who had started a, a B2B IT service and sold it, grew it up and then sold it and had done well with it. And, uh, but it it uh, for whatever reason the sales aspect of it was never solved. The sales problem we had was never solved, and so we had people from the repair shop, and we were a little too people heavy, and so we took some uh, EIDL money from the SBA, and uh, so that's our problem now. Is we went through all that, we tried different sales and marketing things. And, you know, which were all expensive and we hired a salesperson that didn't work out and that was expensive. And so we went through all that money and now we have that on our balance sheet. And, and that's, so brings us to really the reason for my call is we have a very ugly balance sheet now. We have a good operationally uh, efficient company. And, uh, you know, I think it can be grown but not without, you know, more investment, <clears throat> you know, from me and which I've been doing, I haven't been paid by the business in several months and I still have to put money in, not making, you know, we're not even breaking even every month. Okay. So the question becomes to me is with our balance sheet as ugly as it is, and it's to the tune of like minus 700,000. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear you. Uh, about seven hundred thousand in the hole balance, sheet. Okay. and I still like the business. Still believe in the business, but am I crazy to keep putting money into this thing to try and grow it? Well, Man. let let me ask you this. So, so right now, are you working full time in the business? Yes. Okay, and you're still losing money. You're, you're putting mo- your own money into the business yeah. to keep it alive. Okay. Right. So, uh, you know, a business like this, you have a certain overhead and then you have a certain direct cost, right? So how much more sales do you need to make in order for you to stop putting your own money in? That would be the the first point, hurdle number one. The second hurdle would be to also be able to service that EIDL debt, or are you making that loan payment right now? Um, we're, it hasn't started yet. Okay. So, so, so that's hurdle number two is to make the debt payment. 
Then yeah. hurdle number three is to draw your own paycheck for your right. full-time effort. So, so what does that add up to? So we need about 10,000 more a month in recurring revenue to uh, break even. You need 10,000 more to break even. So that's number one. And then how much will your debt service be when you start making EIDL payments? 2,200. 22. So now we're at 12,2. And how much do we need for you? Another 10,000 a month? <laughs> well, I've never taken myself more than 25,000 a year. Yeah, but that's ridiculous. I mean, yeah. If you're going to run an IT services business, your time's worth more than that. Right. So, so what are we going to say it's worth? I'd like to at least get 50,000 a year. I think that's too low. So, so let's set our sights on a realistic number and um, let's use a, a round figure. Um, let's say, I'm going to open up my calculator here. Well, one more thing I think is relevant here is that uh, I'm really what I'm trying to do is just position this business for my retirement. Yeah, but and, we've got to fix it so that you're paid for your time. So, so if we say your time's worth ninety, that's another seventy five hundred. If we add it to the twelve two, that gives us roughly twenty thousand. So that right. that would be the target is twenty thousand dollars a month in more revenue. Okay. And if you if you had twenty thousand dollars a month in increased revenue, would your costs go up? Would you need another technician, for example, to handle that work? Uh, yeah, we probably need one more. And how much does that cost? Uh, wouldn't have to be a super high level guy, so I'm going to say fifty thousand a year. Okay, so then really our target is going to be. Um, it's 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 going to be more like twenty four thousand ish, twenty five thousand, let's say, to be round. <laughs> and what's your average customer paying you right now on a monthly basis? Uh, probably the average would be around twelve hundred a month. Around twelve hundred a month. Yeah. Okay. So so we need, um, you know. 23, 24, let's call it 25 new customers, new average customers. Okay. So tell me about the sales and marketing efforts you put in that didn't seem to work. What what did you try? Uh, well, we tried a uh, email marketing company. Uh, we tried a uh, sales uh, consultant uh, to come in and get us on the right track. <clears throat> and what did the consultant do? Did they do sales for you or come in to train and teach you? Uh, he had a couple inside sales guys that were going to do telemarketing for us. And okay. they did. And got nowhere. <laughs> and uh, and then we hired a, uh, sale, a salesperson to be our inside sales uh, telemarketer as well as uh, you know outside sales mm -hmm. and then uh, we hired another marketing company uh, that did adword as well as uh, supposedly worked on SEO okay and and the result was nothing did your traffic go up or did you were, no. were there conversations held that never turned into business? What was the result yeah. of all this effort? Uh, we, I mean, almost no leads. We got one new client from the email marketing company that we hired. Very mm -hmm. small, I think five, six hundred a month. And that's what we've gotten. Oh, and there was also one more that we, we hired a, a, a brand uh, uh, advertiser. Guy used to own his own advertising agency for many years and sold it to a really big company. And uh, we, so that was another method that we tried. Okay. So mm -hmm. when do you think that the prospective customers make a decision about getting an IT services firm? 
Uh, at what they, point in their evolution? Uh, just, you know, everybody has an IT company today, right? Currently, when we say we reach out to somebody, we know they use an IT company now. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bar is pretty low in terms of how they measure their level of satisfaction with them. As long as they fix their problems and, and do it fairly quickly, then, you know, that's all they care about. And so it's, it's sort of like a bank when you are switching IT companies. If your bank calls you and says, yeah, we have checking accounts and savings accounts. And, you know, would you like to switch to us? Well, you already have checking account and savings account with your current bank. And it's a lot of trouble to switch. So mm -hmm. they're not interested at all in talking to IT companies that call them. So that's tough sledding. Uh, so you're really limited in the market, if you don't differentiate, and I, and I mentioned before how we differentiate, but uh, if you don't differentiate, then you're just limited to, uh, you know, being the one they find when they become dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. and yet, there is a percentage of the market that's dissatisfied, you know, all the time, but we don't have the SEO to be visible because the, the market is only the few of you and you're still invisible in that regard. Sorry, your your mic keeps cutting mm -hmm. out. You you said you didn't have the SEO to be visible, so you're right. you're too down, too far down on the uh, search engine rankings. Right, right. So okay. we're still not showing up when they're looking for when those people that are looking are finding somebody. Okay, and so because you have in person technicians for doing face to face live service calls, you have a certain market trade area that you deal in, right? A certain right. distance from the office you're willing to cover? Correct. Okay. So but there are basically two types of people you can sign up. You can either sign up a brand new business that doesn't have this service yet, or you can sign someone up when they become really upset with their existing provider. Correct. Right. So, so then the question is, is of being known in the marketplace for either new starting businesses or someone who becomes dissatisfied? Well, yeah. And we have the, I think the SEO problem solved because we, the repair shop that we had, you remember earlier, I, I mentioned we have, a, we have a lot of Google reviews associated with the repair shop that we have. So we changed the name and, and we just are in the process of changing the website so it looks more B2B. And that has excellent visibility, SEO. So our plan is to put that website out there as a, a B2B, you know, uh, IT service instead of a repair shop and let that be our hook in the water. And uh, so then we don't, we're not so dependent on SEO being good for our primary IT service business. Okay. So... I I think that I've got a pretty good idea of what what you've been doing and what's going on there. And we have an idea of how big this business would need to grow if this growing your existing business was the solution. You said you had another question about changing the business, about getting into a new kind of business. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that idea? Well, obviously, uh, I'm interested in getting a source of income. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that a content business while, while I'm sure they need work, you know, it, it, uh, at least from a distance to me appears that you could work on it, you know, at, uh, during those periods where I'm not so needed at the IT company. And then if I go through periods or phases of where I'm very much needed in the IT service, uh, that the content business would just sort of keep on, uh, you know, existing, and not start sliding downhill if I'm inattentive to it for, you know, a few days at a time. Okay. And so did you have some ideas of what kind of content business you'd, you'd be interested in? And are I you thinking about starting one or buying one? Buying one. Okay. And so you buy, for example, a content business where the discussion has something to do with, and I'm just going to randomly pick, you know, like, like strollers and it's all articles about strollers with Amazon affiliate links to buy strollers. And this creates an income stream for you. Right. Okay. So I, 
I'll, I'll give you a little bit about a, a little feedback on some of the experiences and some of the people I've been dealing with lately that give me some of these insights. So in, in September of 22, I went to a conference called FinCon and it's for all of these financial and money bloggers and YouTubers and TikTokers and all this kind of stuff, as well as people who do like the content websites, like blogs, where they're talking about credit cards and all this kind of stuff. And I can tell you that the people who are in that industry, who are creating these quote unquote passive revenue streams, streams through these online media properties mm. are working full time. Like there's, there's nothing passive about it. They're, these are real businesses and they're, I think, analogous to uh, the magazine or the publishing businesses of the, of 30 years ago, right? There are people, these people are constantly working at creating new content, creating new articles. They're constantly reorganizing the, you know, behind the scenes script and text of the website pages so that they get better results on the search engines, et cetera. Yeah. And I have uh, direct knowledge of several transactions where people have bought these kinds of things and something has happened in the handover that caused the traffic to go down. Mm. Uh, someone who I know is, is an expert in the industry, he describes a lot of these businesses as being built on, on matchstick stilts, mm -hmm. that being that they're very fragile. Um, what, and when you start to make any significant changes to them, you can really upset how the different online algorithms are interacting with them. So there's a certain fragility to it. But as a person who uses content marketing to advertise my own business, I know that there's extreme value in this kind of thing. And my fear for you is that if you start to divide your time and attention away from this business that you have today, which mm -hmm. is not making money, but you have a, a base there that has momentum, right? Um, I think that it, your IT business would further suffer if you were dividing your time and attention onto this other thing. Yeah, that's a concern of mine. Right? However, I totally think that you should learn about content marketing because i think you need to start using it as part of the solution to fix the it business yes and i'm in the process of doing that yeah so you know there's all kinds of things i might recommend like a blog a youtube channel where you're interviewing your technicians where you're talking to your customers all kinds of content you could be creating you know the top three things to check before you call your it guy you know all kinds of information that could further separate you. And you, you pointed to this out yourself that the IT services are becoming a commoditized type of industry. Yeah. Um, when people go looking for a business like yours, if they type into Google, you know, um, IT services in this certain community, or if they type in help fix my computer in this town, like there's, there's all kinds of things that people type in. If you start to have things like YouTube content, well, Google and YouTube are associated and sometimes the answer to a question is actually a YouTube video is what Google brings you, right? Mm -hmm. It can help you with the positioning of the IT business. You, the very first thing I would do after this call is I would get a piece of Bristol board, you know, one of those big cardboard sheets that children use for, for school projects down, mm -hmm. at, down at Dollar General. I would go get one of those and I would draw a thermometer that has 25 boxes on it. Because I think your number one goal is to get 25 new customers. Yes. Right? For sure. That will get you, <clears throat> that will bring the revenue up and it will fix the problems that we're talking about. And then it won't completely get you out of, out of hot water because you have this big debt and everything that, but it will at least service the debt and allow you to take a paycheck. Right? Yeah. And I think that the content marketing is sort of the secondary activity. You mentioned downtime when your IT company doesn't need you at a, all the time. The downtime activity is building a as big as you can an online uh, canon of information 
that talks about customers, problems, common problems, et cetera. And all of it is an advertisement for your business. But I, your primary activity has got to be to get out there and meet people, business owners, and meet people that are starting new businesses. And so like, how do you do that? Where do you go to find the people that are starting new businesses? If you think, if you think about that, you can start to realize that there are different organizations, different agencies that help people with, you know, startups and things like that. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of ways you can start to network through those organizations to make them aware of what you're able to do. You know, you can offer some kind of new business startup package for people where you will help set up, you know, their, their network security and all kinds, all the things that a new business needs, maybe before they even know that they need it mm -hmm. to open the door to being their preferred supplier. Once they realize they do need a regular contracted IT service provider, but I like, I don't think telemarketing and email blasts and all that kind of stuff is the way to do this. If I was trying to sell, you know, a hundred dollar item to thousands of people, I would be thinking about advertising. But when I'm only trying to make 25 transactions, that's purely a sales function, which means getting out there and trying to meet people face to face. Like you can spend some time on the telephone calling businesses to try to find out who the decision makers are. But if you can't get through and you can't find the decision maker and you can't figure out where to go, you just, you show up, you just go into the business yeah. and, and just start talking to the person at the front say, Hey, I'm Chuck. I run an IT services company. I wanted to stop by and, and introduce myself for the day you decide that you want to look at another provider. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, you lay it out there say <laughs> that we end up getting customers when other companies drop the ball. And that's why I want to make sure you have my card. Yeah. Right. And, and open those conversations. And as you start to build up material online, whether it's a blog or a YouTube channel or what have you, then that becomes part of what you're providing. You know, you can say, you know, it, does it cost you money every time you call your IT company? Cause we have, on our website, the top 100 fixes for problems in, that are common workplace, you know, situations or what have you, right? Like you, you want to open the door to the fact that you are providing value, even if they aren't your customer. And as okay. soon as some, as soon as they start to consume your content, I mean, the, the whole reason that you know, being on a, a format like YouTube works is that people get a chance to get to know you. And when, and people always prefer to do business with people they know, like, and trust. And yeah. so video is a great medium for that. Right. And if you've been in this business for eight years already and your number of clients hasn't essentially changed, it means to me that you're providing a satisfactory service to those people, but there's an issue around recruiting new. That's, that's yeah. the problem. Right. Yes. Yeah. So how, how often have you gone out personally to try to make connections and meet people and visit with the local Rotary Club and all that kind of stuff? Uh, well, I did that initially. That's where uh, I think many of our customers came from mm -hmm. for the pandemic. But then once the pandemic hit, people didn't want you coming into their building anymore. Um, you know, they just weren't open to that. Um, now, I do think that people are starting to loosen up towards that again nowadays. So uh, my plan is that, you know, once we have, because we, we need our messaging on our website. Right now, our website is terrible. It was done, the content was done by this guy that I had brought in to help me. And he's, he's an engineer, you know, he want, he's not a marketing guy. That has to be fixed. And it needs to be consistent with the messaging that I'm mm -hmm. and talking to them about. Right. So they can go to it and, you know, I need some kind of probably a little brochure that I can leave with them that also has that consistent messaging. You know, I'm depending on them to sell us to the boss, you know, and they can't, you know, technology is not something they can do. You can really describe very well, you know, if I don't give them something 
and use to be able to illustrate why use us. So what, so what you're saying is that the business is not strictly in a presentable state right now. Correct. Okay. But we're, it's almost there. We're, it's, we're, it's an active process that we're at the end of. Okay. So when you were working with the different, um, like the, the sales consultant and, and all the other people, and then I think you mentioned someone who used to own an advertising agency. Was this something yeah. that they initiated or pointed out to you? Uh, was what something about the whole website and the branding and the messaging and the consistency? Uh, no, this uh, after the um, we parted ways with the guy that was I had you know helping me run it. Um, I w- he was the one because he had success in you know, creating a company like ours and growing it up and selling it. I was letting him call the shots on that stuff. But, you know, once we got to the point where, look, it's, it's not working, uh, we need to reset here and go our separate ways. And uh, so now I'm in control of that. And this is only in the last couple of months. Okay. So I'm, I'm, that's when I started redoing all of that. So you're right. That stuff needs to get done. There has to be consistency and brand and message and what you're communicating and, and all that kind of stuff. The, you know, obviously that stuff should have been worked on a long time ago. Yeah. The, so what kind of time have you put, given yourself a deadline for getting this stuff all into place? Uh, well, actually, we're hoping to get the website live this week. Okay. So it's so, that imminent. <laughs> all right. It won't so, be perfect, but at least it'll be live and, and much better than what we have today. Okay. So... The the key here is action. Yes. Is is getting out there and having conversations and meeting people and handing out business cards. And I was in I was in Florida back in September. And from what I could see, it looked like 2019 to me. Especially because I live in a place that had lockdowns pretty much for two years. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you know, and and I can totally understand if you go someplace and they're like, well, you know, we're not really open to face-to-face meeting you. Great. You know, uh, where can I uh, book a Zoom call with you? Or like the, the, the point here is not to suffer from the, the fear of rejection or be worried about why someone may not want to talk with you. The key is the activity to get out there and, you know, you, you, you fish where there are fish. So you go to places like industrial parks, you go to places like office buildings that have a lot of businesses, you know, up through all the floors and you take note of who's there, you know, you, you you see who the businesses are and maybe you look them up on your phone or, or maybe you just stop in and you say, Oh, yeah, I've never heard of your business. Is this is this the head office? Oh, it's a branch. You know, we're based in Texas, whatever. Our services are over there. Then you know that that's probably not going to be a prospect, right? Yeah. But but if it is a local business, and I mean, you had people doing cold calls over the phone, what kind of list were they using? Uh, just ones that we bought. Okay, and you still have those lists? Yeah. Okay, and... Or were there any kind of notes or anything that were kept by those people? Um, there were, there are, yeah. So not, not, uh, I wouldn't call it high quality uh, documentation. Yeah, uh, there's some. Okay. So the, the, the sales activity has to be continuous and consistent. Yeah. And so this has got to occupy a good chunk of your time. Like you got to block out probably hours every day, just attempting to converse with people who are decision makers. And when people tell you, no, they already have a service provider, then you want some kind of mechanism to be able to continuously follow up with them. Even if it's mailing them a postcard every quarter. Yeah. Right. Because again, what we're waiting for is we're waiting for their existing provider to make a mistake. Right. Right. 
And we want to keep top of mind so that when that existing provider makes a mistake, they're willing to come to you or they're, you are able to influence them in such a way to demonstrate that you are not like the others. Yes, that's what I'm hoping for. A compelling enough right. message to break through so you don't have to, you're only limited to the market that, of people that are interested in switching because they're unhappy today. Okay. That's a small percentage. And so what can be a forum for you to share your message? So for example, um, if you are doing one-on-one communications, and remember, we only need 25 wins. Yeah. Right? So one-on-one -on -one conversations where you get an opportunity to talk to someone and if they, you know, are open to a longer conversation and you, and you kind of talk about how you've helped other companies adopt new technology that has saved them, you know, the, the plotter that eliminated one and a half draftsmen, you know, what is that worth per year? Like a hundred thousand dollars in labor savings, right? Oh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. So I would have a whole list of those stories so that, at the drop of the hat, you can just say, hey, would you like to hear about how I helped save a company $100,000 a year in labor? Right? Yeah, and, I and, thought I'd re put some case studies on the website about those. Right, but before you have all the case studies done, and no, and if you direct people to go look at the case study, they're not going to read it. Oh, the, okay. the, the people who will read it are people who are sneaking around on their own in the evening trying to check things out. They might read it. But if you meet someone and say, go look at my website for the case study, they're not going to look. But if you say, if you have just five minutes, can I tell you the story about the customer? I saved them $100,000 a year in labor. That is a, is a, is a, is a hook to yeah, get that's someone's That's a pretty interest. powerful hook there, yeah. Right? And, and I would want to have an array of those kinds of stories that might be applicable to different types of industries, Right. The manufacturer yeah. story, the distributor story, the office, uh, you know, clerical type of story, these different stories. So you can say, would you like to hear this story? And and then, you know, their job is to manage the business to be more profitable, right? They're going to want yeah. to know how, how did you do that? And you can share the story and say, this is what makes us different as we try to learn about our customer's business. And, and this is the way that we add value. And Another way that you can use those kinds of stories, obviously, is if you record yourself telling those stories that to help build up content in a YouTube channel, and then those videos get embedded in blog posts on your blog site, right? So it's all related, but you go to visit, for example, a local Rotary Club meeting to talk about the IT services business. And you say, I know you guys would be interested in this. Let me tell you the story of the time I saved someone $100,000 a year in labor. You know, and, and who's at the Rotary Club? It's a bunch of accountants, some lawyers, some doctors, some business owners, right? And right. these are people who either might use you or they know people who might use you, right? It's yeah. that consistent instigation of conversation in your marketplace, You're getting out there all the time, meeting new people, getting to know people signing yourself up for the chamber of commerce event where you're going to be able to go and meet these people. It's only 25 wins, right? Yep. Which, which is barely two new customers a month in a year. So if you're talking to 10 or 15 business owners a week, that's like 60 conversations a week, not counting trying to get in front of the Rotary Club and stuff like that. 60 conversations a month to try to find two people to sign on, right? So, so the message I'm trying to get across is that this is doable. Okay, well, that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> right, especially if people are using, like you pointed out, the commoditized services where they're getting some kind of virtual service where they're not present in the community. Right. Yeah. I would, I, some of the low hanging fruit here will be the neighbors of customers you already have. Yeah, that's a good idea. Because it gives you an in. You can say, you know, we, we take care of the services here next door. Maybe you've seen our van here before. Yeah. And it would be very easy for us to, you know, take care of you as well. Okay. 
I actually have some experience, pretty good amount of experience uh, doing outside sales. So I'm sort of an old school you know, door knocker myself. I don't have any experience inside sales, so I'm very limited there uh, in, in how much I can really help. I mean, in that regard, but uh, it's really encouraging to hear you say the experience I have is actually very, very helpful because of, I'd been told otherwise from you know, the guy who was helping me run the company and as well as other places that that's not the way to do it. So, uh, I, yeah, listen, <laughs> any way you can meet someone and, and I'll tell you, I've had in my prior sales career, I've had, um, I've often done big territories where I'll spend five hours driving somewhere and I'll have two appointments set up and then I'll have maybe three hours between those two appointments so what do you do, right? You either sit yeah. down at a coffee shop and just kind of fritter away the time or you do something actively. And um, what I used to do is I used to drive around industrial parks and just walk into places without an appointment yeah. and just and introduce myself, say, this is who I am and this is what I do. And, and I, you know, the person who's there at the front, the receptionist or greeter or whomever, I would often say, you know, I, I do this and this for companies. Is, is that something you take care of here? And 99% of the time they would say, oh no, I don't do that. Well, well, who takes care of that then, right? And, the, and even if the person's not available, you can leave your card and probably take theirs. And so there were many instances where I walked into a business I didn't even know existed, talked with the person in the front, secured the business card of the person who I needed to talk with, and then later called back and said, and let, even if you don't get through to the person, you leave a voicemail. I was in your office yesterday and I was talking with Janine at the front desk and she gave me your number because she told me that you're the person I need to speak with. Would you please give me a call back? And it opened up a conversation and ended up closing the business over the phone and internet, never going back there again. But the whole thing started because I walked in the front door and introduced myself. Yeah. And I've done that too, and that's actually, you know, what I'm good at doing. Yeah. And so, and so that's really my answers are part of my question in terms of, you know, best strategy going forward. But you've already answered the other part too with it. Am I crazy to keep going in this thing? But because it, it, you know, it's 25 customers to me sounds like a lot, but I've been in this same bubble for a long time, you know, and uh, it, it. So I didn't really know what my perception of how accurate that was. Um, well, you, of, you probably like, what would be the population of the market that you're in? How many people are there? Uh, there's definitely uh, three, 400,000. Yeah. Okay. So, so three or 400,000 people, there's probably close to a thousand businesses there. Uh, oh, it must be more than that because there's there's definitely more businesses. There you go. Now, now a lot of them are branches and offices, you know, where they don't make these kinds of decisions. Yeah. But but there's plenty for you to work through, right? Yeah. Um, and are there any other people that do what you do that are smaller, like one man show kind of people? There are. You know, that's a. They're usually, uh, that's a whole different, it's pretty easy to compete with those people because, of, you know, they're, they're not able to really service everybody very timely. Yeah. So here's why I ask, because you told me that you are likely going to need to add one new technician if you add 25 customers. Yes. So you may want to approach some of those one-man operators. Mm hmm about being that new technician, just ask them, say, look, are you still happy running your own business? Or do you think that you might prefer to go back to being an employee somewhere? Because I need to add someone. And if I can add someone and acquire some customers at the same time, that would be, that would make a lot of sense for me. Right. I've thought about that in the past, but I, I'm assuming I would have to structure some type of, you know, uh, commission on the accounts he brings in or something. Sure. Make that work. What, what would you suggest? Well, so if somebody joins you and you give them some kind of offer, like you come and join me and I'll pay you, 
you know, a technician's wage, but for all the accounts you bring over with me, I'll give you a percentage of the revenue for as long as you're with me. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you, if you gave the guy, you know, five to 10%, I mean, it's still going to add, you could backfill half the school. Yeah. Right. By doing that. Okay. I hadn't thought about that in a long time. I'm glad you reminded me of that. Yeah. Because it's, it's one of these places where, again, it's it technically oriented people, like you pointed out, and they, they do the work every day. And a lot of the times they'll get lured by the notion that having their own business is going to be better for them. Uh, but then they get into the bookkeeping and the customer service and all the other yeah. stuff. And you mentioned yeah. they, they don't do a very good job. And it's because they, they're they probably technically focused individuals, Correct. not necessarily business focused, right? And yeah. so sometimes these guys are like, what, you mean work for you? And then I'm going to be able to take a vacation every year? Like, yeah. you know, right. And, and the and, revenue, it tends to be volatile. So it goes up and down. Yeah. So it, it could very time. well be an attractive proposition for some of them. And again, it's about getting out there and, and talking to them and having these conversations. If any of them are close to retirement age, you can make them the same offer without the job. You can say, well, if you want to hand your clientele over to me, because I know you're not in a position to go paying for other businesses, right? But if somebody only has six or eight customers, mm -hmm. it's not really a business that mm -hmm. many people are going to want to pay for anyway. Yeah. But if if you say to them, like, if, if you want to retire, I'd be more than happy to take over your customers and give you a percentage of revenue for as long as they're with me over the next decade. Yeah. It's like paying a salesperson a, a long mm -hmm. tail commission, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good idea. I, I got to figure out a way to get that message out to attract those people. You pick up the phone and talk to them. Every I don't know that they advertise, though. Well, this is part of the feedback that you're going to get when you go out and do your face to face calls. Oh, I see. What you mean when I come across people being served by a solo technician? Yeah, when they okay. when when someone says, "Oh, we don't need anyone. We we hired Fred." Yeah, you say, "Fred, I've never heard of Fred. Can you give me his phone number?" Okay, and then you call Fred and and talk with him because he's Very probably nice. heard of you, right? Yeah, probably. And you can just say, "Wait, <clears throat> you know, whatever excuse you want, but invite him out for lunch or something, right?" There's yeah. there's no um. This is the kind of thing that happens in the pest control and janitorial industries where there's a lot of one-off operators. Yeah. And they, they, they get courted all the time by bigger companies who create retirement programs or offer them to onboard them as employees. Yeah. Uh, because some people, they get to a certain point where they, they'd rather just be back to, to getting a regular paycheck. Yes, I've actually hired some of those in the past. Did any of them ever bring any customers with like... you? Did anyone bring any customers with them? No. Oh. Uh, they well, actually, uh, one did, but you know they they tend not to be. Now that I think about it, they were they were they were just paying as they go. And that tends to be the model, what we call break fix in our industry. Right. And that doesn't work for us because, you know, I have to staff technicians for demand that I don't know when it's going to be needed. So they have all this capacity and no, no idea of the demand. So you talked to me about your, and, and we just have a few minutes left, but you talked with me about your differentiation, your value proposition, how you spend the time to get to know someone. What I would do is I would formalize it and I would name it. So as part of your service contract, for example, you do, you know, Chuck's annual office technology review and create some kind of written framework with some some graphics, some images, yeah. 
maybe workflow charts or what have you, so that you can visit with the client and do sort of a technology audit and make some kind of presentation back to the client so that so that you're not just telling them we take the time to learn your business. You can say part of our annual service contract is to come and do this technology audit. And then we're able to come back and let you know if you're optimal or if we can see any opportunities for you and what those opportunities might might represent as far as value. Because yeah. now you're talking about a tangible deliverable, which the other people are not talking about. Right. Right. And then, and that makes the differentiation that much more concrete. Yeah. We're just right now in the process of implementing a software to give people, we call it an IT roadmap. Okay. It does what you're talking about. We just rolled it out to one client so far and testing how that goes and then we'll be adding more. Glad to hear you think that's a good idea. Oh, absolutely. Because the people who are doing break fix, they're not talking about that. And the people that are trying to be low cost providers in the in the whole commodity IT service, yeah. they might be trying to sell other things, but they're not saying this is included because of our holistic attitude and approach. Right. Yeah. And, and we're really trying to be, put it in more concrete terms like you know, your payroll is $100,000 a month, and we save you even a few percentage points on that payroll over time. That pays for the cost of our service. So, yeah, we just don't have any way really right now to be able to track that or, or tangibly show them that. I wish we did. So, if you have any ideas on that, let me know. Well, <laughs> You know, I used to work in purchasing. It was one of my first jobs when I was still a student in university. And I remember in our purchasing department, we would get multiple quotes for different things that were more expensive. And one of the things that we had to do is we had a monthly report and we would say, you know, request for quotation one, two, three, four, five, whatever the number was. Yeah. Um, we were looking for this category of product mm -hmm. and we got quotes ranging from this amount to this amount. And what we would do is take the difference between the price we paid and the highest quote. And we would say, this represents the value of me doing the exercise. Because if we didn't go through and do this RFQ, we might've ended up paying the high price. Yeah. And so each one of us as purchasers at the end of every month would have a report often showing realized savings of four to five times what our pay was. Yeah. And that, that was what our manager wanted in order to be able to justify to the organization just how valuable the purchasing department was because of the, of the savings we were able to recognize. And so I would say you want some kind of framework or record keeping that allows you to monitor or take note of these changes over time so that you can represent a cumulative value. So if you help them make a change in year one that saves them 50,000 a year, well, in year two, you've that you still save them that 50,000 and maybe you found something else that sold them, saved them 10,000. So after four or five years, you can give them this annual report that says, since our relationship began, we've helped you save a cumulative amount of this. Right. right? And you're just driving home the value of the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You just need to figure out a, a framework to we can get that. In. Yeah. And track it. And and to track it so that you can so that you're able to keep talking about it as time goes on, because the the company you helped them buy the plotter, it wasn't just the first year that they saved the money. They've been saving that money every year. Right. Okay. Good idea. Yeah. All right, Chuck, what's your goal? Uh, get my, I forget what you call the cardboard. <laughs> it's your Bristol board. Bristol board. And put 25, uh, what'd you say, notches on it or something? To, you want a you thermometer know. with 25 degrees. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Fill it in as you go. And you get a race to get those 25 customers as fast as you can. 
Okay. Got it. So this was really, really well worth uh, having this conversation because I, I, now I feel 100% committed to that it's possible and I'm not an idiot for continuing to pour money into this thing. Uh, and it, you know, because I've got good people and we have a good operation. So we just need to make the sales happen. So, yep. Yep. Uh, you spend time with decision makers. Mm -hmm. Yep, I got it. All right. And, and it's doable for me. <laughs> so, it is. Yeah. All right. Merry Christmas, Chuck. Okay. Thank you, David. Merry Christmas to you too. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.